sponsors for this event. Uh, it was, uh, we got some funding for tonight from NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program and um, some help from AUS and NOAA 
and the UAS Coastal Rainforest Center um, and the Southeast Alaska Fish Habitat Partner. So I want to thank all of those groups. Um, and also we have some people on the phone, are actually through the web tonight, that are joining us remotely. So thank you for joining us here too. We've got Molly Tankersley from University of Alaska's Coastal Rainforest Center that's helping run that. Um, so tonight we have a chance to learn about ocean acidification in Alaska and what we know so far about conditions currently in our state and what we are able to forecast so far into the future and what we know so far about how species may respond. Um, there's going to be several speakers tonight. The first is going to be Jessica Cross. Jessica's waving her friendly smile. Um, she's with NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle, and she's an oceanographer that's been studying ocean acidification up here for many years. Um, and then after that, there'll be Bob Foy. Bob is waving his friendly face. Um, Bob is the recent new director of NOAA's Alaska Fishery Science Center. Um, and has been running the NOAA Kodiak Lab in Kodiak, where he's been submersing crab for the last few years in acidified waters, and is going to tell us all about that. Um, and a big part of this evening is going to be Q&A after the presentations. Um, we really hope that this is a two-way communication, um, where the goal, our goal here is really to help educate Alaskans, but also hear questions and concerns and make sure that we're doing our best to meet information needs. I just realized I forgot to introduce myself. Um, my name is Darcy Dugan, and I'm with the Alaska Ocean Observing System. And I um, coordinate the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network, which was started about two years ago by a group of interested scientists and stakeholders um, that wanted to make sure that we were working together to do our best to expand the understanding of ocean acidification in our state, um, and also uh, work together to think about what we can do to adapt and mitigate as we go into the future. Um, so our goal tonight is that you will walk away feeling more informed and also that you feel like you have places to go to find information uh, and to engage in dialogue both now and in the future. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jessica Cross. Thanks. Thank you so much, Darcy. Um, Darcy has worked really hard to coordinate this event um, and to make sure that all of you knew to come out tonight. Thanks again for the number of people we have in this room. I'm so excited and flattered and honored that you guys um, still want to hear what we have to say. Um, it's just really a testament to how great it is as a scientist to work in the Alaskan community. It, it really means a lot to us that you guys care about what we do because we are here for you. Um, we're here to work for Alaskan communities and for Alaskan businesses. So thanks again so much to coming out tonight. And thanks again to Darcy for organizing everything. So please join me. So there's going to be a lot of people to share the mic tonight. Um, and each of us has sort of a different expertise. So I am here as your friendly neighborhood ocean chemist. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what the basics of ocean acidification are and sort of set up a frame for what is happening with ocean acidification around Alaska. So for those of you who aren't necessarily aware or need a few of the basics, I want to direct your attention to this slide right here. Um, what is happening with ocean acidification is that as we emit more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the ocean naturally soaks that up, just like a sponge. This is a cycle that has been happening you know, since it, all the way through Earth's history. Um, and so as we emit more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, about a third of that gets absorbed by the oceans. And when there's too much CO2 in the water, we actually start um, uh, to cause a decrease in pH, which causes a cascade of chemical reactions that can be really complex. Don't worry, I'm not going to hit you with complex chemistry. I'll try and make everything as easy to understand as possible. Um, we're going to walk through it together. Uh, but part of the reason this is a problem in Alaska is because Alaskan waters already have a ton of CO2 in them. So they're naturally vulnerable to ocean acidification because you only need to add a very little bit of human CO2 to actually cause some really big changes um, in Alaskan seawater. Um, so some of those are directly related to ecosystems, and we're going to do our best to try and stay focused on this ecosystem perspective because those are the natural resources that Alaskans rely on. You know, I can study some pretty esoteric stuff that even my colleagues think is super boring, but I am very interested in because I'm a dork. Um, but uh, I'm going to keep it focused on ecosystems for you guys. 
So as the pH in the ocean declines, um, we really think of it in three sort of separate categories. The impacts on ecosystems in three separate categories. One of them is that it can have direct effects on the organism's body itself. Whether that is dissolving your shell or stressing you out, it's just direct effects on your body. Right? When, when, when we don't get enough sunshine, we get stressed out, right? Um, the same ocean acidification could cause the same sorts of stresses um, for particular species. On top of that, um, there's some sensory effects that can happen, especially to salmon. Um, and so th what happens here is that rather than it being a direct impact on that organism's body um, and their metabolic functions, instead they sort of lose their perspective on how to interact with the world. And Bob is going to talk a little bit more about that, so I won't get too much into it right now. Um, the third way that ocean acidification can impact ecosystems is by impacting their food web. So let's say that ocean acidification impacts a particular food source. So even if OA doesn't have an impact on the species itself, the species that we're interested in, if we're taking away that organism's food, on the other hand, with ocean acidification, there's still a secondary OA impact on that particular species. Again, that's uh, really a lot related to salmon, and Bob's going to talk a little bit about that in his talk. So cumulatively, the, the effects of these stresses may reduce the productivity of commercial and subsistence fish stocks, which can ultimately damage Alaskan fishing and food security. I don't need to tell this room how important that is. Alaskan fisheries comprise 60% of U.S. Fish catch, fish catch by weight each year, over a million metric tons of seafood annually. These are all numbers that you guys have taught me. It's 100,000 full-time equivalent jobs, $12.8 billion in economic output by the time that reaches the rest of the, of the United States. Um, but on top of all of that you know, really high dollar value, Subsistence fishing is also a really important resource for small communities in Alaska. You know, 95% of Alaskan households uh, participate in subsistence activities using fish, and more than 15% of Alaskan households rely exclusively on subsistence fishing for food. So when we talk about the impacts on Alaska, we're not just talking about economic damage, we're also talking about food security. We're also talking about rural community security. <laughs> Now, I've hit you with a lot of information out front, and the most common question that I get, no matter how long I talk about that, is, so what do we do? Um, so your scientific community is actually working really hard on this question. We're trying to, to tease out a lot of the complex stuff to work directly on ocean acidification. So NOAA's ocean acidification program groups it into three separate categories. I'm the person who studies the environment and how ocean acidification in the environment is changing. Bob studies uh, ecosystem and species sensitivity, um, which then uh, uh, gets roped into bioeconomic models and human dimensions, bringing that back towards you. So all three of these pieces are closely interconnected. But I actually find that it's a lot easier for people to understand when we put that in a storyline. So I'm going to adopt this um, climate resilience toolkit cycle. It comes from the U.S. Climate, uh, the U.S. Global Change Research Program, U.S. GCRP, and so this is a, a framework that we've actually adopted, working specifically with several Alaskan communities, uh, mostly in Southeast and in the Aleutian Islands, um, to uh, actually build plans about how we're going to uh, adapt to ocean acidification in the future, what these communities specifically are going to do. And that's what this framework is designed to help them figure out. So the whole frame of this talk is going to be pitched in this cycle. So we know ocean acidification is a problem. What do we do? Step number one, we need more information about what that hazard actually is. What are the specifics? Um, we have a really high uh, uh, thriving ocean acidification observing network in Alaska, um, some of which is reliant on these drones. That's a new piece of our observing system we've just added in the past year or so. Um, if anybody in the room is familiar with the sail drones, um, those are uh, unmanned sailboats that are actually about the size of a sailboat. It's really hard to tell the scale from this particular slide, but anyone who's ever sailed on a Hobie Cat before, I mean, 20 feet long and 20 feet tall. They're really big. Um, and they enable us to collect a lot of really great and new information. 
But here's in total what the footprint of our observing array is right now. We work with ships, we work with moorings, uh, which are sensors that stay in a specific place 100% um, of the year. We work with gliders that help us get a little bit more of the spatial variability. Um, we work with drones, uh, but the most important part of, of our observing system are our partners. In particular, we started to partner with the um, Naval Research Laboratory, um, uh, 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 the Office of Naval Research. We also have a really strong partnership uh, with the Ocean Acidification Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, several small businesses, including hatcheries, local tribes, and then as well the state of Alaska Marine Highway System, which you'll hear Allison Bidlack talk a little bit more about uh, later in this talk. Uh, so one of the new pieces of, of our observing system um, just this past, what, year and a half? This past year, Darcy? Uh, two years. Past two years have been our community-based observations. We actually have a community sampler here tonight. <laughs> our Juno representative has joined us. Wave your hand. <laughs> um, and so uh, these community-based sampling networks have organized primarily in South Central and Southeast um, and are really reliant on tribal organizations. And so they're taking weekly surface samples for us in hopes of building a really long-term time series so that we can see how ocean acidification is steadily progressing over time directly in these communities' backyards. Um, there's about 20 different communities taking samples now, and we're just starting this on the North Slope. So that's a rapidly growing um, form of our observing system. So while some of our observations are focused on these really long-term time series, we also collect seasonal data. And again, you'll hear Allison talk a little bit more about this. Um, but this is an example of the seasonal sampling that we do from the Alaska Marine Highway System. So this is output from one of our sensors on the MV Columbia. And what this is showing us is um, time, is season, essentially month of the year along the x-axis, along our horizontal axis, and then the latitude along the y-axis. So this is in space and time, the ocean acidification that we're seeing from this particular sensor. Um, now red colors are a little bit more uh, corrosive than cool colors. This is the danger zone, as it were. And what this sensor has been showing us is that we see a lot more acidified water cropping up in winter. And that helps us understand where and how to focus new observing efforts um, uh, 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 when we uh, grow our observing system in the future. So the point of all of this is that when we are able to get this massive spatial footprint, when we know what is happening in all of these different kinds of territories around Alaska, the really near shore that the ferry gets us, the open ocean stuff that the, that the um, boats can get us, um, the surface stuff that the drones get for us, the bottom uh, observations that the moorings get for us, what we are finding is that ocean acidification is already happening in really important habitats. So one key example of that is crab habitat, and Bob will talk a lot about this in his talk, but we're essentially seeing ocean acidification happening right now uh, in, in these, uh, these um, areas that house these really important populations. But there's another ecosystem hotspot as well on the north, um, uh, in the Chukchi Sea in North Alaska. So what's happening there is that we think that this might be a food web impact that ocean acidification appears to be reducing the size of clams. And these are clams that walrus feed on. And so there's really short linkages in the food web in northern Alaska, right? It goes the phytoplankton, clams, walrus. There's not a lot of intervening steps. So if ocean acidification starts reducing the energy value of those clams, that can have an impact on the walrus. And we don't know if that's happening yet, but that's an ecosystem impact that we're um, uh, uh, looking more into right now. Um, step number two, so we've assessed our hazards. We know where ocean acidification is happening. We know vaguely when ocean acidification is happening. We know that it's happening in areas of important species populations. Um, step number two, assess the risk. Is this exposure to ocean acidification exact going, actually going to be a problem? Well, part of that is to understand that exposure is increasing over time. We're starting to work with a couple of models now that show us how ocean acidification is going to project very far into the future. And while this doesn't tell us exactly what's going to happen with the ecosystems, again, that's an area of ongoing research where we're starting to build our results into ecosystem models, we do know that ocean acidification is probably going to get worse in the future. <clears throat> 
Um, so Bob then takes that current status information from us, Bob takes that future projections information from us, and starts to talk about the impact on particular species, impact on particular ecosystems. And I'll let uh, him talk a lot more about that. Thank you, Jessica. Good evening, everybody. So I asked this question of uh, the UFA group earlier today, uh, how many people think ocean acidification is impacting our environment or is going to inf impact uh, species in particular? Okay, so I've got a few people still to convince. Um, about the same number of hands, you know, 10 years ago, one or two hands went up. So I think we're doing our job and that's our goal here is to communicate our science and communicate what we're finding in our laboratory research and then scale that up to community um, engagement and community response to uh, what we're finding. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about are some um, uh, projects that we've been working on in the laboratory to look at the effects of ocean acidification on species in particular. And my focus is mostly on uh, commercial crab species. So our goal at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center was to focus first and foremost on commercially important uh, fish species and uh, their prey, uh, and then their shelter. So we did a number of projects working on coral as well. We also um, are, wanted to focus our, obje our objectives on supporting uh, pH monitoring. So trying to figure out where pH is changing and how that relates to the environments for the commercial fish species and their habitats. Understanding uh, species specific, specific physiological response, again, I first need to know what is the effect of the individual animal and then scale that up to the population to truly understand how this is going to impact our ecosystems. And then lastly, develop these forecast models uh, looking at population impacts and then we can start thinking about economics. So, oh, and then lastly, um, what we're working on with FY18 through 20, um, for the last uh, eight to nine years, we've been building infrastructure and looking at the physiological effects. Our goal now is to take that information and then see if we can't figure out how these animals may be adapting or acclimating to their environment. So a lot of the research I'm going to show you tonight is setting that threshold for what the negative impact could be. The ultimate goal, though, is to then better understand the genetics, better understand what the adaptation may be, so that we can scale that back and communicate what the real effect of ocean acidification will be on some of these stocks. So how is ocean acidification affecting a crab? Um, unlike Jessica, I am going to touch on chemistry. Uh, she set me up. Uh, so we have to talk about chemistry in order, in order to understand uh, what's going on with ocean acidification. But it's actually fairly simple. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes into the water. It mixes with the water. And here's the key, it binds up carbonate. So when carbon dioxide enters the carbonate cycle in the ocean, it grabs up the carbonate, making bicarbonate. Why do we care? A lot of animals need that carbonate to build a shell. And this was some of the original concern related to ocean acidification, is the understanding that the carbonate is important. Um, what else is important here? Well, we talk about the acidification, the decrease in pH. So that is important in and of itself. So ocean acidification is a double threat. Uh, to shell building organisms, it's the carbonate withdrawal. And to every organism, it's the change in pH. Why does pH matter? If you go to the doctor, uh, the doctor's going to look at the pH of your blood to look at your health and look at your metabolism and look at how your chemistry is functioning internally. It's the same thing in a fish in the ocean. Uh, pH changes the ability of the gills to work properly. pH changes the ion balance in the blood, uh, changes the ability of chemicals to move, for instance, moving calcium to the shell of a, of a, of a crab. So understanding that dynamic is, is hugely important, and that's what our concern is with ocean acidification. So with that, what we have found, and a number of studies uh, throughout the world have found, is that a lot of animals that are exposed to acidification environments are first and foremost, uh, it affects their respiration. That is because it's changing their metabolism. It's a stressor, as Jessica mentioned. It's another stressor in their environment they're, they're trying to fight. So their metabolism increases, that's a way we can measure their response. We're seeing greater energy being put into shell maintenance in crabs. 
So they're diverting energy to maintain shells. They're changing the pH of their blood. Um, they're keeping it constant, and that requires energy. Um, less energy in reproduction and growth. So this is the concern. We're seeing a negative effect in, in many crab species, and I'll, I'll get to this in a moment, um, on the effects of reproduction and growth of, of acidification. So it's likely that this stress is, is going into maintaining their physiological functions at the expense of some other key life history um, processes. And then lastly, changes to the stress tolerance and their ability to continue to uh, tolerate further stress. So how do we do this? I've mentioned this already. We're looking at the organismal response. We're then scaling that to the population and the ecosystem response. So our experiments began in 2010. Uh, we're looking at commercially important king crab and tanner crab species. We're looking at each of the life stages. So we've been holding crab for multiple years, uh, two to four years per species over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, so that we can raise these animals throughout the oocyte development, which is the eggs, uh, the larval development, juvenile development, um, and we're not taking them all the way to adult. Uh, lastly, what are our response variables? We're looking at survival. Do they survive a lower pH environment? Uh, fecundity. Does the change in pH affect their, uh, the number of embryos that they're producing? Morphometrics. How do they grow? growth, calcification, hemocytes. So we've uh, published a couple of papers looking at the effects on hemocytes. Hemocytes are the cells that are um, responsible for their immune function. They're also responsible for moving calcium to the shell. So we will look to see how acidification affects the hemocyte, hemolymph. Uh, we're looking at genetics right now to see what kinds of proteins are expressed in an in acidic environment. We're finding that, and this is a, a publication that's coming out this next month for red king crab, they're putting a lot of energy. Proteins are being expressed to support the cuticle, the shell formation. Uh, we can visibly see that throughout an experiment with our genetic results. Uh, and then lastly, mechanics. We're finding that the mechanics of the claw in um, tanner crab are negatively affected by ocean acidification, where the carapace is not. Why does that matter? The claw is required for crushing that bivalve for food. If that's more brittle, perhaps this negatively affects their ability to feed. So that's a result from some of our work. So I'm going to focus on one particular strain of work on tanner crab here. Um, so what we've done, in, and this was about 12 years ago, we started building our ocean acidification research laboratory. And at first it was biologists trying to become chemists. And it was kind of ugly at first, um, learning how we were going to, to go about dosing these systems and understanding the carbonate cycle in an enclosed environment. It's, it's a very complex system. Uh, we've built a system now where we take carbon dioxide, we bubble it into seawater, we then can set different levels of ocean water for what we expect the ocean to look like in the next 30 years, 50 years, and 80 years. And then we can expose the different life stages of crab uh, for over two years in some cases. So a pretty exciting project, highly demanding uh, of time, and um, we didn't learn it overnight. So we've got lots of uh, holding tanks here and, and experimental tanks and a flow-through monitoring system. Um, as you can imagine, I said carbon dioxide goes into water and it instantly becomes something else. So that means I have to measure something else. So we've got a lot of chemistry that we're measuring in our seawater systems in order to make sure that we're truly treating these animals as we expect it to occur in, in, in the wild. Uh, so what did we do? And this might be kind of hard to read, so I'll just kind of talk about the highlights here. Um, we ran multiple year experiments where in the first year we brought in um, moms. We brought in female crab. We exposed those crab to acid acidified conditions that were um, ambient, just the water coming into the laboratory, a pH of 7.8, a pH of 7.5. We exposed their larva. We then ran a number of experiments uh, looking at the effects on those larva. But the key was we ran this for multiple years, so we repeated that again and again. So by the time we get to year three, these animals that made it all the way through the experiment, they were exposed as, as embryos and oocytes, eggs inside the mom. They were exposed early in the process. What we're finding is that the amount of energy 
that goes into those eggs early in the process has something to do with how the mom is exposed to acidification. She doesn't see any impacts directly, but we do see impacts on her offspring two years later. So there's a, uh, an effect down the line. So some of the uh, things that we're looking for, uh, this is an embryo. That's the eye of an embryo, uh, the yolk sac, the embryo itself. We measure the morphometry. We measure how this changes over time and understanding growth in an acidified scenario. We find that at our lowest pHs that we expect in the world's oceans on average in about 80 years, um, that the, the yolks are 10% larger and the embryos are 6% smaller. The yolks are 10% larger. Fantastic. That means more energy, right? That seems like a great a result. What does that mean? Why are they doing that? Um, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so part of the reason we think they're doing this is they're trying to acclimate to their environment and they're slowing their metabolism down. So they're trying to make sure that there's enough energy to maintain those physiological balances. But it comes at a cost. So I'm going to show some of the larval hatching success results, so some of the more basic results here. And again, we ran the project for one year at an ambient, a 7.8 and a 7.5 pH. Uh, ambient is around 8.0, 8.1. And then uh, we have year two. The lighter color part of the pie chart here is viable larvae. So these are larvae that hatched, they survived, they made it, they grew up. Um, the darker parts of the pie are non-viable hatch larvae or eggs that did not hatch at all. So what we're seeing is that, the, again, these larvae that are exposed over two years, 50% at a pH of 7.5 are not surviving. So if every female is producing 200,000 embryos, 100,000 are now not making it. And it might seem like, well, there's still 100,000 out there, Bob, but this is just one of many stressors and, and you know, your average uh, larval crab doesn't make it. But if you take 50% off the top, it has the potential to affect recruitment uh, for these animals to the juvenile stage. Again, we found that they were smaller. One interesting result, and, and this is what leads me to what we're doing in 2019, is it's not necessarily all negative. We don't know how these animals are going to acclimate in real life. Right? I take these animals from the Bering Sea, I put the adults in a cooler, I put them on an airplane, I bring them back to the Kodiak lab and put them in a tank. Um, so, the, obviously, there's laboratory type effects here um, that we don't completely understand, and in the wild, there's likely to be some acclimation. So the question is, could they be acclimated? And we have, we're, we're starting to see some hint that that is possible. Uh, for instance, the larvae that survived the first year, those that did not die, survived longer afterwards suggesting that there's a portion of those larvae that may be better adapted for the future. So there's some hope in that. Um, we saw the decreased metabolism and the potential for higher reserves, so they're trying to physiologically adapt to their environment. Um, so juvenile crab mortality and growth. So at the juvenile stage, uh, we've run a number of projects. Um, this is the number alive. The dashed line is pH 7.5, and the solid line is a control at uh, pH 8. So what we're seeing here is that those in the lower pHs are not surviving as long. They're dying earlier. In the juvenile stages, we're, we're actually seeing at about 200 days of juvenile growth in the acidified environment, uh, we're seeing that increased uh, mortality. We're also seeing slower growth. So the animals on the dash line of 7.5 are growing substantially slower. Some of this might be tied to those energetic reserves that I was just talking about at the larval stage. Um, this could also suggest that there's a trade-off going on. We're finding that there hasn't been an effect of calcification. Remember I mentioned that the, carbon, uh, uh, the carbonate is important for the shell building. We're not seeing a lot of difference in the shells. That suggests that the animal's putting a lot of energy into making sure that carbonate stays into that shell and biologically making sure that that happens, perhaps at the, at the tra uh, trade-off here in condition and growth. So to overview some of the effects that we've seen and to talk about the potential for acclimation or adaptation, uh, we have seen lots of effects at the oocyte embryo stage. There may be decreased metabolism, uh, suggesting that we're acclimating. 
at the juvenile stage, we've got this, this trade-off. And at the adult stage, um, some of our work has shown that they are maintaining their the pH internally in their blood system, uh, suggesting, again, that it's more important for them to maintain that immuno immunological function than it is for them to, to grow. Um, so what does it all mean? How do we take this laboratory study that suggests that there's a higher mortality, that suggests that the tanner crab are not doing as well, and scale it up? I'm going to show you some results here for red king crab. Red king crab we have found to be more susceptible to ocean acidification than tanner crab. And tanner crab more susceptible than snow crab. Our more recent results I'm not going to show today, we don't show an effect of acidification on snow crab. That's pretty exciting because it's our largest shellfish fishery in Alaska. Um, but what we find with red king crab, one of our more lucrative fisheries in Alaska, is a substantial impact. So what we've done is we've taken these laboratory data that shows a, a level of, of mortality, a change in growth. We've taken those results and we've mathematically incorporated them into populations dynamics models. Big words. These are the models that we use to predict how many crab are in the ocean. These are the models we use to say how much crab can be taken out of commercial fisheries. So they're, they're, they're complex, um, but they're rather well done in terms of the amount of effort that's gone into them. We, we have um, a fair amount of certainty in the output for a lot of these models. So if we're able to take some of the laboratory work and input it into these models, it gives us uh, a tool to potentially predict where this could all go in terms of the population. We then took those results, we incorporated them into economics models. Uh, so these are uh, bioeconomic models that consider the red king crab fishery. They consider um, which communities are, are dependent on the red king crab, um, how much uh, resource uh, funding, um, um, fiscal um, response and, and costs associated with these different fisheries, and then produces some of our projections um, based on uh, you know, what we know about the fisheries. So what have we found? So we published a paper looking at red king crab, and with just some of the basic information, where the proportion of the larva hatching declines by about 25% over the next 80 to 100 years. So that's that pH 7.5. What does that mean? That means about a 50% decrease in catch and profits about 20 years after this onset of, high, of uh, low pH uh, or ocean acidification in Alaska. About 20 years. And that's the buffering and the, the variability that we already see in the recruitment from these stocks. What does that equate to? About $500 million to about to a billion dollars in total welfare loss to the state of Alaska. So fairly substantial. Again, this is an outer threshold. This is what could happen because of the response that we're seeing in the laboratory. And again, our goal now is to scale that back and understand it better. So I'm just going to show a couple of slides because people always ask, so what about some other species? What are we seeing? Uh, this is some research that's being conducted down in our Newport laboratory. Um, for uh, northern rock sole species, we are seeing some effect at the larval stage where we're seeing higher mortality um, in experiments where they're exposed to acidified waters. Our initial work with pollock and cod has shown that there was no effect on um, basic survival. More recent work that's going to come out very soon is showing that there is a behavioral effect, that we are seeing that pollock and cod are negatively impacted by acidification because of their ability to feed um, and their ability to move in the water column, up and down in the water column, their response. Um, Jessica mentioned earlier that for salmon, uh, there's been some research at the University of Washington that has shown that uh, lower pH water affects their olfactory um, uh, senses, their ability to smell food, which is potentially going to negatively affect their ability to feed. Uh, we, we conducted a study a couple of years ago looking at coral. Uh, so one of our goals here was to look at um, red tree coral. Uh, this is a critical habitat species in Alaska. Uh, so we ran a number of projects to expose coral to these the same acidified conditions. It's awfully hard to raise coral in a laboratory. Um, so it was a short-lived experiment. Um, we ran it for about half of a year. Um, some of our results showed that the reproductive processes in coral are, are negatively affected by lower pH water. Uh, we were not able to um, 
fully complete the study again because it's difficult to raise these animals. We did see differences. We looked at uh, CT scans of the skeletal structure. We saw um, a decreased mineralization in that skeletal structure, and then again, a decrease in some of the reproductive processes. So again, what it suggests is that animals such as coral that are already living in very deep water can still be a, a affected by this anthropogenic increase in um, carbon dioxide in the deeper waters. So lastly here, just a, a, a couple slides to, to talk about um, mitigation. There's been a lot of talk about increasing uh, seagrasses or macroalgae. Um, there's some talk that we could do this on a grand global scale and reduce carbon dioxide levels. Um, I don't think we're going to be seeing uh, macroalgae covering the entire shelf anytime soon. That's going to accomplish that. However, there has been some great success in doing it on a very local, small scale and relating it to aquaculture. Uh, so for instance, there's a number of farms right now that are bivalve farms that are staggering macroalgae and bivalve in order to um, protect the, the bivalves and then also utilize the macroalgae. Uh, right now in Kodiak, we have a, a program where we're working with the um, local kelp industry. Uh, we've seeded a substantial amount of um, uh, sugar kelp in the last couple of years that has actually turned into a commercial operation that's gone to market. Uh, we're seeding just about as much as they are on the East Coast right now for sugar kelp. Um, we've got a project right now with the Kodiak Area Native Association where we're, um, we're looking at environmental monitoring associated with the macroalgae farms that's allowing us to also then understand ocean acidification because we're looking at carbonate. And that's important because we're not just looking at great big ocean, blue ocean water changes in acidification, we're looking at local processes. And as some people might ask, you know, what is that, that natural seasonal variability that you see in the, in the near shore waters? It's substantial. We see huge changes in pH in local waters, and that's why we need to monitor. But what you see is those, those seasonal and daily changes, you see them shift, you see them start to go wider. And that's our expectation with, it, with acidification, is that that's what you're going to see. So um, we need to monitor that so that we have the baseline information, and we're doing that right now associated with these macroalgae uh, farms. And we've got um, sites where we're monitoring. We heard earlier there's a monitor here from Juno, and uh, we're monitoring all of the um, uh, rural sites in the Kodiak Archipelago right now. And then um, there's been some work to to look at risk assessments associated with this um, at a large scale across the state of Alaska. So the results of this study, uh, as you might expect based on what I've showed, is that there's a lot of risk to communities that are highly tied to commercial fisheries. The potential impact on, and, and the focus of this study was mostly on species that we think there really is an effect. And we still don't know a heck of a lot about most of the species in Alaska. We've got a long way to go. So uh, this was a, a first study to understand how this is going to affect coastal communities. And something that we, this study was not able to accomplish is the whole ecosystem effect. What happens when copepods are negatively affected? What happens when lower trophic levels are negatively affected? No one's really looking at it right now. There's a few studies out there, but um, it, it's difficult because we don't have the capacity to conduct these studies. Um, and then uh, next, we're going to move to investigating options. Yeah. And Jessica's going to take it over again. Thanks, Bob. Um, so just like I started by talking about, the, about our environmental hazards, step one is to understand the hazards that your populations may be exposed to. Step two is to understand what those species and population responses are so we can understand what the actual risk of that exposure is. Step number three is to investigate options. What can we do about this? So Bob talked a little bit about macroalgae and kelp farming in his talk too, um, but this was actually a question that was posed to us by UFA two years ago. We came up to Alaska to essentially do exactly the same thing. Um, and a bunch of local fishermen and their colleagues at RIA, they were starting to use kelp to help suck CO2 out of the seawater. And so if you're sucking
who had been soaking up. This might help mitigate ocean acidification. And as Bob said when he was talking, it's very unlikely that we'll be able to grow enough kelp to make a difference on the global scale. I heard not only about this idea, I knew that that was just a non-starter and had mostly ignored this research line altogether. That, not going to work. Um, but it's because you guys asked that we actually started delving into that a little bit more. Um, you know, we don't know necessarily about that kelp is actually helping yet, but we have ongoing in-situ studies. They're happening in Korea, in Maine, in Washington, and now Alaska. Essentially, Bob has gotten started with his um, mariculture and environmental monitoring station with kelps um, uh, 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 all around Kodiak. But the point that I want to make here is really it's going to take more than seaweed to deal with ocean acidification. So while we can apply these kinds of mitigation activities on a really small local scale, individual hatcheries, um, uh, it's going to ultimately take more than seaweed to deal with these big basin scale processes that impact entire commercial fisheries or entire subsistence fisheries. So after that, step number four. If we know a little bit about what our hazards are, what the actual risk is, and what our options for acting are, well, what are our priorities? So ocean acidification is very, very commonly is necessarily the biggest threat that community faces. Right, so a community is in a uh, that's facing coastal erosion um, uh, uh, might not care about ocean acidification, even if OA is happening in their backyard. It's just not their top priority. They have a different existential threat to deal with. Um, and so uh, we've started working directly with an organization called Adapt Alaska um, uh, to uh, help sponsor these workshops with small communities where we can start implementing this cycle. Understand your hazards, understand your risks, understand your options, um, and start helping them write about what your priorities are in specific actions that you plan to take. Spoiler alert, step number five is taking action. <laughs> um, and so, again, we work directly with ADAPT Alaska to, to actually go through and help write these plans. Um, I want to um, uh, talk about briefly, again, so uh, a good example of this is a community adaptation plan that we're working on uh, with um, uh, some communities in northern Alaska, Shishmaref is the example I'm getting to use. Um, so essentially saying that we know that ocean acidification is going to get really bad for them by about 2050, right? It's one of the, it is the earliest onset of sustained ocean acidifications that we see around the state. In this particular plot in the upper left, that's our cool colors right over here. Um, however, that being said, uh, we know that marine mammals that they rely on might be a little bit more resilient to whales in effect. Um, we think that walrus might be a little bit more vulnerable, but ultimately what they care about is this. And so it's not uh, respectful to their community and it's not a good use of, of our uh, advocacy to try and trample that with OA research. Like we're not going to advocate that OA should be a big priority for their community and for their community adaptation plan. By contrast, we do work extensively with Southeast Alaska. Now, some local conditions in Southeast Alaska indicate that these communities probably are going to struggle with ocean acidification in a really big way before other communities will. Um, uh, on this particular slide, I'm showing um, just the season of the year along the x-axis. Um, and then along the y-axis, that's um, years in the future, so the bottom is the present and then years in the future goes up on the y-axis. And the color shading here shows some ocean acidification variables. This particular one is corrosivity. And these red conditions right here indicate um, uh, acidified conditions that are probably going to impact a lot of biology, or we think might impact a lot of biology. So when these red conditions emerge, and they're emerging quickly in southeast Alaska, the fastest of all of these um, sites that I have displayed on this slide, um, uh, 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 that might potentially have a big impact on their fisheries. One of the pieces of feedback that I heard when I was here two years ago is that even if uh, I'm standing next to you or standing next to this plot explaining it, it can be a little bit hard to digest. It's still a lot of chemistry in one plot. So we started plotting that a little bit differently, hopefully to help make it a little bit easier to understand. Same data is on, the, is on this basic line chart on the right-hand side of the graph. 
And so this is essentially explaining the amount of time, of habitat time, the, uh, the length of the growing, the ideal growing season for particular species. And what I want to point out to you is that, again, so this is the percent of the year with ideal habitat conditions along the x-axis and time along our y-axis, so with the present at the bottom and the future at the top. Again, this ideal habitat time, this growing season, is declining such that, um, uh, well, right now it might be about 100%. These different lines indicate um, different species resilience levels. Um, uh, the ideal habitat time for very sensitive species may be reduced to almost 40% of what it is now um, uh, by 2100. Uh, again, that's one of the reasons that we work directly with these local hatcheries is to under help them understand what their specific growing season actually is and how they can plan their business model around the idea that this growing season might shrink in the future. So step number five, take action. We know what the hazards are, we know what the risks are, we know what our options for acting are, we set our priorities, ocean acidification actually is going to be a big deal for us among the many other problems that our community has. Now it's time to plan to do something in the future. Step number five, co-develop an adaptation strategy. So Darcy Dugan, um, the, uh, who introduced our event tonight, is actually going to talk a little bit more about this in the future. Um, but the point that I want to make is that we are developing really close ties to commercial, tribal, and subsistence fishing groups in addition to producing easily accessible public material that describes ocean acidification so that your community knows how it is going to be affected and how which businesses you might need to focus on or which sectors of your economy that you might need to focus on when you're making community plans in the future. Um, we're also working directly with a couple of lo local hatcheries, as I've mentioned a couple of times in this talk, again, to help them understand what their business model is going to be like in the future. Um, we have four of them now, Sitka, Ketchikan, Seward, and Kodiak. Uh, some of these are small businesses. Some of them are run by tribal organizations. But, you know, as a nice side note on the scientific side, um, step number five, take action, also applies to us. We want to make sure that we're actually starting this whole cycle over again based on what we've learned, what you need, what your priorities are. That helps us start new research lines like we did with the kelp a couple of years ago. So we're starting to target um, hotspots and unknowns with research. Um, we have new platforms we're deploying. Again, the drones are new these past um, uh, since I came and talked to you a couple years ago. Um, we also are starting this network of hotspots uh, in the northern Bering, Chukchi, and uh, Beaufort Seas uh, around the northern edge of Alaska called the Distributed Biological Observatory. So that means that anybody who visits anywhere close to those spots to work on science will stop and take some samples. So just like our community samplers, they're helping us build a time series, a crowdsourced time series that help us understand what's happening with ocean acidification in these particular hotspots. Um, we are also working we're also starting to work with models a little bit. Um, in particular, I work with a program at NOAA called Innovative Technology for Arctic Exploration, and our goal is to build new sensors and do cool new stuff. Um, we, we had exploratory missions that happened this past year uh, with a couple of new sensors that are going to help us operate again in the really far north, which I don't know if you saw in this talk was a big gap in our research. It's hard to get there. The ice messes with our instruments, so we want to uh, make sure that we're trying to get into the Arctic. Um, that's a photo of me, because I got to get off the ship in a small boat in that icy situation and take that picture, which was so cool. <laughs> um, uh, 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 and um, again, coming back to bring it all together, the idea is that we're trying to inform and develop this observing network that has ships, that has aerial drones, that has um, uh, these seagoing drones and all of these uh, different pieces of our observing system to help understand how to better study ocean acidification in the future. We can reprioritize as we go down the line. Um, so one of the new uh, observing systems that we've actually put together is called Ferry for Science. Uh, that's our system that's currently on uh, 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 the uh, MV Columbia. Uh, and I'll invite Allison Big Black uh, to talk about our brand new hot off the presses preliminary results Nobody else has seen this except you. I hope you're excited. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. Um, I'm so happy to see all of you here tonight. This is great. 
Um, so this is a project that we started about four years ago. Um, it took three years for us to actually go from conception to implementation. Um, we thought that, you know, we've got this great ferry system here. They run from Bellingham to Skagway across the Gulf to Kodiak all the way down the Aleutian chain. We thought, why aren't these ships collecting the data that we need? Easier said than done, right? So we uh, partnered with a few different people, with the Hakai Institute, with NOAA, with the Alaska Ocean Observing System, and we managed to get some instruments uh, installed onto the Columbia. That's a picture on the left there. That's a picture of me and Wiley Evans, who did all the heavy lifting. Wiley worked for the Hakai Institute in British Columbia, actually. Uh, he installed these, this system of instruments um, down on the car deck, and then there's also instruments up on the upper deck of the boat um, and in the bridge. And um, believe it or not, the Coast Guard doesn't like it when you want to drill a hole through the hull of a 485-foot passenger vessel. We had to go through a lot of paperwork um, and a lot of meetings with engineers and boat yards and such. Um, that took a long time to do, but we got it done. And so now what this, this system is doing is, as the ship is underway, about every three minutes, it's pulling in seawater from under the waterline running it through these instruments and collecting all sorts of data. And I'm going to show you some of that data uh, in a little bit. And then that data is being streamed up to the web. Uh, the data goes to a lab in uh, Washington, that's a, in Seattle actually, at NOAA. That data is, is slips through, it's QA, QC. And then the eventual plan is to put it up on the web. And I'll get to that in a little bit. All right, so, oh, it's just going. All right, so what this is showing you is, in, on the right, is the track of the ferry. Um, up and down from Bellingham to Skagway and back. And then what you're seeing here then is the data that's, that it's actually collecting. Um, in this case, this is a metric of the corrosivity or how corrosive the water is to shell building organisms. And what you can see is that um, we see changes over the season. So this is from, this is basically November uh, 2017 to October of 2018. And you can see these like differences in seasonal um, patterns, I'm going to play that again, um, which isn't surprising. We know that there's differences in pH of the ocean and ocean chemistry across seasons, across, you know, from winter to summer, but what's really cool about this system is that this is the first time we've actually seen what the spatial pattern looks like. So we have all these um, shore-based sensors or moorings throughout southeast Alaska, and they'll show us what happens in one place over time. But this is actually showing a pattern that we never knew was there. And that's showing this really interesting spatial pattern. Um, and so there's places like the Strait of Georgia there between um, Vancouver Island and British Columbia that seem to be incredibly corrosive. Uh, there's other places, and like Lynn Canal, which is up to so the very top here. Lynn Canal tends to be very corrosive as well. These areas are really corrosive in the Strait of Georgia. But there's other places that aren't so much. And those are being affected by freshwater discharge, or maybe just ocean currents, and we are learning about all of those things. The ferry also collects all sorts of other information. So I won't show all of it to you, but we have information on sea surface temperature, on salinity, on pH. It also collects um, either derived or actual information on total alkalinity, on dissolved oxygen, on the um, amount of CO2 in the water. And so the great thing about this system is, well, we're learning a ton. As scientists, that's really exciting. But it's also really interesting and exciting for the people that rely on, on ocean resources, right? So um, Jessica talked a little bit about Southeast Alaska and how Southeast Alaska, we're going to have a real problem here in terms of ocean acidification. You talk to shellfish growers here, they're concerned about it. They know, they look at their compatriots down in Puget Sound. Those folks are having a hard time growing oysters down there. And so, you know, what is it going to look like here 20 years, 30 years, 50 years? into the future. We're hoping that the information from this boat will tell us something about that, not only how it's changing, but maybe where are the places in Southeast Alaska that might be better for siting shellfish farms. What can, you know, what can we figure out about ocean currents or um, just the seasons? You know, are there better times and places to, um, to, to put a, a shellfish farm or to start growing? Um, the other really neat thing about this is that it's a really great outreach and learning tool. So that's in the bottom here is Wiley. This is actually Wiley giving a talk on the ferry um, and to, to a raft audience. And then we also had a school group from Ketchigan come in um, and learn all about ocean acidification on the boat. Um, the Department of Transportation has been a fantastic partner in this. They have been amazing letting us have access to their boats. Um, and so we really keep our fingers crossed that our ferry system will keep running into the future. Um, 
And so, and as I mentioned earlier, we are hoping, we, it's not done yet, but we're hoping to have all of this data available almost live on the Alaska Ocean Observing System website, where you'll be able to go in, sort of zoom into the area you're interested in, look at sort of time over time, what that's looking like. Um, and so we hope to be able to have that information available to the public as soon as possible. So with that, I'll hand it back to Jessica. Thanks, Allison. Gosh, this stuff is so cool. Um, and Allison and uh, in particular Wiley Evans at the Hakai Institute have really worked hard with a number of partners um, to make this come to fruition over the last four years. It was a real passion project for him and it's producing great data finally which is just so gratifying to see from a scientific perspective. Um, I'm really just going to be your MC here for a moment. So I've talked to you a little bit about sort of what the federal framework for understanding climate impacts on local communities is, sort of walked you through that hazards, risk, options, priorities, action, the five steps in that process. We've talked a little bit about how we're as scientists taking that to heart too, that it's not just on communities to accept the data dump that we give you guys. We work with you uh, to help you understand how to incorporate these new changes uh, into your community planning in the future. We also take that to heart as scientists, adapting our observing system to, to learn more about what we're observing along the way. This is a, an observing system and a research process that's actively in flux, and we want it to be as close collaborative as possible. And so, you know, um, what do we do is the next question that I always get. So a, a citizen who is not the CEO of a major company or who is not a state or community legislature in this room, what can you do? And actually, we have a really good answer for that. And I'm going to turn it over to Darcy Dugan to talk to you about what individuals can do about ocean acidification in Alaska as well. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so yes, before we get to the Q&A, which I know a lot of people in this room are looking forward to, I'm just going to talk a little bit about community engagement that's gone on so far and also point you to some resources if you leave here today with more questions that you come up with later or want to point your friends and colleagues towards. Um, so again, the Ocean Acidification Network is basically to help bring people together, whether that's researchers to help identify monitoring gaps or work together in a more collaborative way or to bring groups together like you all tonight, um, including some web resources. Oh, this is a slide that shows the partners in the network right now. So you'll notice that there are state and federal agencies on here. There are research institutions, um, including multiple branches of the University of Alaska. Um, there are hatcheries, there are fishing groups. UFA has been a wonderful partner. Um, so we welcome additional partners if you uh, would like to join. Um, there's also a lot of resources on the website. We're hoping that this will be a clearinghouse for ocean acidification information in Alaska. So it's got nuts and bolts. It's got an expertise database, which is shown there. That shows, um, in fact, you can see Jessica and Allison are on the top there. It shows who is working on ocean acidification in our state, what their specialty is, and how to contact them directly. Um, and then there's links to databases. We have monthly interview with a scientist. Um, oh, and I should also mention that we have a website uh, that's a monthly website. There's a sign-up sheet in the back, um, and we try to keep it interesting, usually an article on um, some type of new results, something with mo involving monitoring, um, stakeholder questions, uh, videos, um, and a little bit on community engagement from the past two years. We've held two State of the Science workshops that have brought people together um, that work on different aspects of ocean acidification and from many different stakeholder groups. And the network also has six topic-specific specific working groups that are listed here. So this ranges from fishing community engagement, communications and outreach. We've got a K-12 through education group where we're working with teachers to figure out um, what kind of resources do they need in schools to help teach our next generation of um, people that are going to help us with our environment. Um, the tribal monitoring group that Lindsay is part of, um, et cetera. And then we're doing our best to respond to information needs. So we sent out a survey last year on ocean acidification to stakeholders asking what their questions were to make sure that the researchers are trying to answer the same questions that the people in Alaska want to have answered. Um, and it ended up that those questions were pretty well correlated, but we got a lot of um, questions, some of which we can't answer right now, and some of which we realized we pretty much could answer right now, we should, in ways that are understandable to the general public. So we started this 
video series called Ask a Scientist. It's once a month or once every other month where a scientist answers one of the questions from the public in five minutes or less. Jessica and Bob have both done that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> holding community roundtables like this, so far we've had them in Sitka, Kodiak, Cordova, Yakutat. Um, I think I'm missing a fifth, but if you know a <coughs> community or from a different community where you'd like to have a round table, we can absolutely put one on. Um, and then creating special pages. We've got a question and answer page for fishermen that answers questions that are most relevant to fishermen. We just put up a curriculum page for educators um, that has Alaska relevant curriculum by concept with direct links. So we're trying to make information easy for people. And Jessica's pointing to the new ocean acidification state of the science reports. This was actually, idea was brought to us from United Fishermen of Alaska that said it would be really helpful to have some brochure that kind of goes through at an easy to understand level that you don't have to be a scientist to figure out um, kind of what we know so far in Alaska. And these have been going like hotcakes. We just printed another 400 of them this past week. Um, but it's encouraging to see that people are interested and we hope to update them annually. Uh, and we always like to finish presentations with what can you do so we don't all feel like our ocean is acidifying and we are all helpless. Um, some of these are small things you can do. Others take a little more effort, but we encourage you to check out the website for the network and to join the listserv in the back. Um, circulate information with your friends. You, there's six working groups if you're interested in being active in a working group. Um, Talk to your, our congressional delegation about ocean acidification funding and policy, or your friendly legislature that's not too far away from here, um, and to support green energy policies at the local, state, and national level. Um, and with that, I think I'm gonna, we'll, we'll go ahead and open it up to questions um, with Allison and Bob and Jessica up here. So we know we hit you with a lot of information, what do you guys want to know? We've got a whole half hour for you to ask questions. So sure, I see one in the back. Um, a lot of the trends that people were projecting for climate change have started accelerating much faster than anyone expected. Uh, I don't remember. You may have had a, might have had a slide. Is ocean acidification accelerating faster than you expected? And can you predict a point at which all bets are off? We don't know what will survive. Sure, so there's uh, a couple of pieces to that question. So just to repeat, in case it was difficult for anybody to hear online, uh, the question was there's uh, uh, been some recent uh, papers have come out that said that climate change is accelerating faster than we expected. And is ocean acidification going to accelerate faster than we are expecting? And if so, is there essentially like a drop dead lever that is eventually going to get pulled for the ecosystem? Um, so I'll tackle the first one first. Um, so basic climate change literacy point uh, is that climate variability is real. That has happened throughout Earth's history before humans even evolved, right? Um, uh, however, what's important right now is the rate that climate change is happening. That it's much, much faster than any point in Earth's geologic history. Um, and so we're essentially running a, a, an uncontrolled experiment. Uh, and that can be really difficult to say, well, what are the impacts of that going to be? Like, we don't know. There's not a really good analog for this in Earth's history. And we can try and pull out a couple of examples that might be similar and that have, you know, robust scientific uh, 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 basis of saying that, hey, this might be similar to the present. But really, this is, ha this is on an unprecedented scale and is happening much faster than anybody has before. The second part to this question is to understand that when scientists write papers, um, we try not to be melodramatic. <laughs> we don't want to be um, alarmist. We don't want to give people the impression um, uh, 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 that we're exaggerating our results. So we tend to be pretty conservative, actually, uh, when we're writing up our results, saying like, oh, it, impacts might emerge by 2100. Those are probably going to emerge sooner than that. Um, but we don't want to, you know, overblow our credibility by saying that. Um, uh, in particular, there's been a couple of IPCC reports re recently released that are trying to cor correct 
uh, some of those conservative estimates. When it comes to ocean acidification, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, there's a lot of money and understanding and, and international organizations that focus on climate change, and there's some of that for ocean acidification too, um, uh, but it's really hard for us to say what's going to happen with the oceans on a decadal scale and if we're being too conservative or not at this point. Um, uh, the third part of that question is whether or not there's a drop-dead lever that we're going to throw. Um, uh, Bob can certainly speak more about that, but the comment that I will make is that ecosystems are complex. Uh, and it's, it's oversimplifying to a single drop-dead lever is probably dangerous. I'm not going to talk about the drop-dead lever. <laughs> uh, but I do have a couple of comments uh, associated with the question. Uh, one thing that we're finding is the concomitant effect of climate change, uh, temperature increases, and ocean acidification at the same time. So we published some work looking at the increases in temperature effects on this metabolic stress in animals and have found that it exacerbates the issue of acidification at the same time. So that's something that uh, is going to be of more importance is this multiple stressor issue um, that, that's happening. In addition, we're seeing different processes exacerbate the situation. So at sea ice edge, as the sea ice is receding, we see a lot of production at that sea ice edge. That production, if there's not a full pelagic ecosystem to use that carbon, ends up on the bottom. You have bacteria that eat the organic matter and that produces carbon dioxide. So we're seeing high levels, high hot spots of carbon dioxide that might not be carbon dioxide from above, but it's climate change processes that are exacerbating what we're seeing with the ocean in and of itself. So um, all these the climate change processes are working together. Um, you know, in the climate change, you know, we all know about like one degree Celsius, two degrees Celsius. So just, what are some numbers, like what is the basic ocean acidification? I saw like 7.5 and 7.8 and 8.0. So is there some rough idea like we're now at 7.5, we don't want to go to 7.8, it would be really bad if we go to 8.0, just some like numbers like that? Sure, so I tried to touch on that a little bit in the last question. Um, it's The field is, of ocean acidification is comparatively young. Uh, when it comes to, uh, 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 you know, relating it to metrics like the IPCC. It's really hard for us to apply those metrics because we just don't know enough. When we talk about impacts on ocean acidification, generally we, we talk about one specific variable. Um, and if you'll forgive me, I'll talk a little bit about ocean chemistry right here that I've tried to avoid for you all night long. Um, but that's a really great question, so we're going to get into the basics a little bit. So this one particular variable is called the calcium carbonate saturation state. It's a mouthful, otherwise symbolized by omega. And so this omega value essentially describes how many carbonate ions are floating around in the water. And as Bob said in his talk earlier, these carbonate ions are, 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 are molecules that organisms use to build their shells, skeletal structures, and tests. It's what a crab builds its shell out of. So as ocean acidification takes these ions out of the water, um, it makes it harder for that crab to build and maintain its shell. In some cases, it might outright dissolve. We've only really seen that on the laboratory scale. You're not going to find dissolving crabs in the ocean. Please don't go look for that yet. Um, uh, but anyway, so this omega variable has a couple of important thresholds. From what we understand on great laboratory grade pure calcium carbonate, um, that omega level of one um, uh, uh, means that if you drop below that level, you're corrosive enough to degrade laboratory grade pure calcium carbonate. Um, and it's when we reach that omega level of one or less that that could be a really easy way to apply one of these drop-dead metrics. That's a complicated thing to say um, because not all organisms react at omega level of one. A crab doesn't build its shell out of laboratory-grade pure calcium carbonate. Um, algae form on the outside of that shell that can provide a little bit of buffer against ocean acidification. So the, the value is squishy. 
Um, on top, what we tend to understand, you know, when I'm writing, when I'm talking about environmental chemistry, I'm most interested in calcium carbonate saturation state levels or omega levels at or less than one. Um, I tend to apply the metric um, that, you know, once we hit that corrosive conditions, once we hit omega level of one, there's the potential for impacts to occur. Just the potential, not necessarily sure impacts, but hey, that chemical potential is now there. Um, and when we drop down to omega levels of 0 0.8, 0 0.6, um, which we have observed in areas around Alaska, then we're starting to talk about rapid and severe impacts. On top of that, you need a sustained acidified condition. You need that um, uh, corrosivity to be maintained for a good long time to actually dissolve calcium carbonate. It's not instant. Just like the ice or snow doesn't melt all in one day, it happens gradually, right? One molecule at a time. And so for you to be able to see impacts takes a little while. So not only is it a function of how you as an organism react to that chemistry, it's how long the chemistry sticks around. Um, so again, we're talking about the, the, the nuance is what that exposure hazard is. Um, a lot of the information that Bob gave you tonight expresses that in terms of pH, that's just a different unit. Um, the saturation state, that omega value that I just talked about here, is a little bit more specific. It's chemically precise, as it were. Um, and uh, But it, if I could convert it to pH very easily. Um, it, again, it's squishy. Not every pH is equivalent uh, at a specific level to every calcium carbonate saturation state just because of nuances in chemistry, um, but we're essentially talking about the same things. Uh, that severely corrosive level is the pH 7.6 that Bob would be using in the lab. So, um, sure, in the back. Could you repeat that for me, PSP? Shellfish poisoning. Okay, so the question was for the folks on the phone, uh, is there any correlation between ocean acidification and PSP? Um, so this is a very new area of research. Emergent, not studied in Alaska. So any results I'm about to share are based on observations that have been made in other areas of the world that may not map perfectly onto our state and our state's conditions. But the theoretical thinking is that ocean acidification adds another stress to the environment that makes it more difficult for organisms to outcompete um, uh, harmful algal blooms that cause PSP um, and therefore might make harmful algal blooms more likely and or more severe. We don't know if that's happening in Alaska yet. Not documented. Um, but that is an area of research that we're working on. Um, we're starting to write grants um, to look at specifically that very question. Good, great question. Thank you for that. Have you seen any migration of species to avoid areas of higher acidification in the world? That was way too easy to hand that off. We are not seeing levels of ocean acidification at a anthropogenic carbon dioxide in the water at a level where we can measure the movement of, of animals as a result. Having said that, there's plenty of um, examples throughout the world's oceans where animals are distributed around areas of high carbon dioxide, mostly natural processes. So the expectation is that you will see some movement depending on the level of, of, of acclimation. Uh, right now we have a study that um, we're working on looking at uh, calcium carbonate levels in uh, snow crab shells uh, throughout the Bering Sea and Chukchi Sea. We're in year three of the study. We see variability in that, suggesting that there is a spatial component to their exposure to um, uh, corrosive water. So the question is whether or not that's affecting distribution or, or movement, and we don't have that information yet. Back in the corner. Yeah, so let me just add on to that a little bit. So from, a, jumping back into the line of sight for camera. Um, so uh, from a geochemical perspective, we have observed in Alaska uh, the dissolution products like we, we've, we've measured geochemical bits that seem to be the result of, of calcium carbonate dissolution, but we don't know what's dissolving. There are other things in the ocean made of calcium carbonate than, than crab shells, uh, right? So for us to be able to say, hey, 
that is a thing that is dissolving right here, right now, because of ocean acidification and it's linked to the ecosystems, and we, we can't make that inference yet. All right, yeah, Bob called on somebody. Sure, in the back. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, in southeast Alaska and Vancouver Island, there's a lot of limestone, right? What's the relationship <laughs> impact, or uh, how does that impact acidification locally or otherwise? Sure, so the comment was that um, in southeast Alaska and Vancouver Island, there's a lot of limestone. Um, for those of you in the room, um, limestone is a natural calcium carbonate, um, with the idea being that maybe that can, uh, or in theory, um, erosion of that limestone might be able to mitigate ocean acidification. The comment that I'll make about that is that it takes a very long time to dissolve and weather a limestone. And so the speed with which we're causing ocean acidification of the water isn't dissolving that limestone fast enough to really make a difference. Now, if we're talking geologic time scales, much more than much longer than one generation of humans or even you know one age of humans we're talking about like geologic time thousands of years um yes that chemical weathering is going to play a huge role in how earth adapts to ocean acidification over time but over the short scale sure Allison, go for it but i would say that that's one of the things we're looking at is is looking at different kinds of watersheds and how the water coming out of those watersheds is impacting near source systems. And so yes, I mean one of our sort of trains of thought is that some, you know, there might be a particular cove, say on Prince of Wales Island, that's and the, at the head of that cove is a stream that's coming out of some karst, you know, a karst system. And that actually may have really um, strong local effects. So yeah, that's like where we get into sort of the nitty gritty and sort of very local processes. So if I can um, take questions online really briefly before coming back to the room. Molly, would you read a couple of them for us? Sure. We have a couple from Adam Kirsch in California. He wants to know, why is Southeast Alaska more vulnerable to ocean acidification in relation to other areas in Alaska? Sure. So um, the question online was, why is um, uh, Southeast Alaska more vulnerable to ocean acidification from other areas around Alaska? So uh, there's a couple of parts to that. Um, one of them is that uh, uh, this, the natural variability of the system exacerbates the global process that is ocean, case, ocean acidification. So it's naturally more vulnerable, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of them is glacial discharge. Um, glaciers have a unique carbon chemistry that as it discharges into the near shore, uh, that glacial meltwater can actually exacerbate ocean acidification. And if it's complicated, I'm happy to send you a paper if you're interested in it, uh, but I won't um, bore you with all of the uh, dorky details here in this room. Um, the second reason that uh, uh, Southeast Alaska is more vulnerable to ocean acidification than other areas around the state is because of the communities themselves. Uh, so when we talk about OA risk, um, we're very interested in communities that rely on threatened species or threatened marine resources um, uh, 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 for in, in economic value, um, cultural perspectives, uh, or subsistence food sources. So especially in areas where um, a majority of the community re relies on species for subsistence protein, the vast majority of their systems protein, not just you know, a small percentage, but 95 or 100 percent of their protein comes from fishing. Uh, when the species that they fish or, or harvest are threatened by ocean acidification, that community is more vulnerable. And so we're interested in both of those things. What's the, what's the actual hazard and exposure and risk to the ecosystem, but also what's the risk to communities? So I would identify that in two ways. Anybody else want to chip in on that one? Okay. Next question from the phone. One more question from Adam. It's uh, what legislative and fisheries policies could help mitigate ocean acidification effects? Uh, I will speak for the group. Uh, as a scientist, I am policy agnostic. <laughs> um, uh, but if you are interested uh, in some more of that, I encourage you to interact uh, with the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network that can connect you um, to, do we have a legislative affairs working group? We have a policy group. We have a policy working group, and those folks would be happy to talk to you more about it. Yeah? Bob's nodding at me. Mm -hmm, that was the right answer. <laughs> yeah, in the back, go ahead. 
Do you want to take that one? Sure. Uh, from the perspective of King Crab, uh, you know, roughly we're looking at uh, the year 2040 when our expectation is that the average uh, pH level, or amount of carbon dioxide in the water, is going to be at the level that you're impacting uh, species. Again, that's if they don't adapt, if they don't acclimate. That's the worst possible scenario based on our laboratory studies. Um, and again, that's also based on uh, global averages of uh, the effects of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's been downscaled regionally. Um, there's error associated with that. So that's a, a ballpark number of what our expectations are. Yes. Yes. Um, I was interested in you talking about the tanners having the suppressed immune system. I was wondering if it had any or any relation to the number of the bitter tanners that are seen in Lenny Mount? Yeah, actually they're, they're different processes. Um, the bitter crab is associated with a parasitic infection. Having said that, it's possible that if the animal undergoes additional stress, that it's more susceptible to that, to that infection. We're looking at this in the Bering Sea right now. In fact, we've got a planned study to test exactly what you're asking. Uh, what we found in the Bering Sea that with increased temperature, we're seeing a much higher increase uh, prevalence of the bitter crab. Uh, so we're seeing 18 to 25 percent prevalence right now, where in years past when it was cooler, uh, we were only seeing 10 percent. So it is likely that that's a, uh, a reaction to additional physiological stressors. If ocean acidification uh, gets to the level of a 7.7, 7.8, and you start to see that stress, it's, it's possible that you see additional uh, um, interactions or succumbing to uh, parasitic infection because their inability to fight that off. So right now I would say it's not correlated, but uh, potentially to uh, change in temperatures. Yes? What would an adaption look like in a shellfish or to, to avoid, you know, I guess it would lose its shell, but it would produce faster? Or? Sure, great question. Um, and, and we see a lot of these um, adaptations or acclimation. So acclimation is something that they're already genetically uh, predisposed to. Adaptation is something that you might see in terms of a genetic uh, evolution over time. Um, if, if it's possible for the animal to um, move to a different area or uh, grow faster through a period of high stress or grow slower, we're seeing slower growth through a period of high stress, and then maybe make up that time and still produce the same amount, still have the same, same productivity at, at the population level, that's potentially a stress um, adaptation or acclimation. Uh, you saw here that there's a lot of seasonality in the exposure time. So it's possible that you would see shifting um, uh, periods of, of production. We see that with temperature right now in the Bering Sea, uh, effects of temperature on the changes in productivity. So those are possible acclimations. Um, and it could just be a physiological response. Their ability to manage their own ion structure in their bloodstream might become more resilient. Uh, they might be um, already acclimated to do that. We see that in some of our species. For instance, snow crab, we're not seeing the effect of, of acidification uh, in our laboratory studies. So it's potential they've already had, they already have that mechanism to buffer, at least down to the levels that we're testing. Yes? Uh, do you know what uh, the status of ocean chemistry was uh, in the geological record relative to previous mass extinction events? Um, <laughs> so, uh, I'm happy to connect you to more resources on that if you would like to know. Um, there are periods in the geologic record where ocean acidification was uh, so, so severe that we simply see the absence of calcium carbonate species in sediment layers. Like, they're just not there because presumably because they were dissolving in the ocean water that was over the top of them. As to what specific pH level that was related to, I can't tell you. I do know that it was a saturation state of less than one. <laughs> um, uh, as, as to what was happening specifically in Alaska or on Alaskan shelves, 
Um, there have been a, li a very limited number of geologic time, you know, sediment core studies um, that have happened to actually document that. Uh, the first one just came out, ooh, maybe a, a year and a half, two years ago. Um, I'd be happy to point you to the paper, but that was for um, Arctic Basin. Um, so not even really on the Chukchi Shelf, but off the Chukchi Shelf, looking at sort of this deep geologic time, which again, you know, if you're, if you're looking for links to the ecosystem and sort of, um, uh, 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 um, can't think of the word, um, uh, analogs, analogs to what might be happening right now, we don't have those for Alaska yet. Um, very new area of research. You're essentially looking at uh, at half <laughs> the, the researchers uh, that study ocean acidification in Alaska right now. There's a very limited number of groups, and each of us works with a team, um, uh, but certainly there are no more than four or five groups in Alaska who are studying this right now. So I'd like to say that we will get um, the International Ocean Drilling Program, IODP, uh, to study this in the near future, but probably not. <laughs> Resources are thin. Graduate students in the room? IODP is your friend. I want to see your project. Uh, yes, uh, either. Go ahead. Uh, my freshwater uh, point of view, for example, the, uh, the Great Lakes and so forth, is there, is there problems being uh, studied in places like that? Or is it pretty much a green problem? Um, I certainly, uh, the question for folks on the phone was, is there a freshwater analog to this? Uh, freshwater absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, it's the same chemical process, uh, except without a lot of the salts and calcium carbonate that is natural to seawater, may not necessarily be natural or natural at the same levels um, in freshwater. Uh, as to whether or not there's a program for studying ocean acidification in the Great Lakes, so we can find out more about this, um, I'm working with a young researcher, um, Darren Pilcher, at the University of Washington, who specifically studies the Great Lakes, um, but he does so using models. Um, the observing system in the Great Lakes is really limited, uh, simply because uh, the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program focuses most of its efforts on the coast. The East Coast, the West Coast, the Gulf of Mexico, and Alaska are really four big uh, operating areas. The Great Lakes should be a part of that, and we're trying to expand there now. Um, but that's above my pay grade. Go for it. Do you know if this will increase the likelihood for a more silicate-based life form to appear as they go on? I know that there's, there's a decrease Ooh. amount of uh, free, cat, free cations available for calcium as well. Uh, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, so the question uh, was, is ocean acidification going to increase the potential for uh, silicate-based uh, life forms um, to essentially outcompete calcium carbonate-type life forms? Um, for the room, there's a little bit of context with that. Uh, organisms like diatoms built their shells out of calcium carbonate, but um, uh, other phytoplankton, other zooplankton in the oceans built their shells out of calcium carbonate. Um, pteropods, for example. And so I don't know what the trade-off necessarily between a diatom and a calcium carbonate, um, a, 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 you, you know, a coccolithophore, for example, would be. Um, I generally, diatoms being photosynthetic organisms, um, photosynthetic organisms like kelp tend to benefit from ocean acidification. They have more food. Um, if you remember from your high school chemistry class, plants eat carbon dioxide um, and soak that up from the seawater. So uh, increased CO2 may have great benefits for diatoms. I don't know if that's going to be true for Alaska yet, but certainly that's the theory. Um, by contrast, you know, a, a, a small phytoplankton like coccolithophores, um, they look sort of like soccer balls, um, build their shells out of little calcium carbonate plates, and certainly ocean acidification is going to have a big impact on them. Uh, in particular, there's some studies about uh, impacts of calcium carbonate on coccolithophores that are really important around Antarctica. And so if you'd like to do some more research, great calcite belt is what I would refer you to. The uh, relative contribution of uh, volcanoes to CO2 in the atmosphere. I'm sure that's documented in the IPCC report. <laughs> um, I'm not going to throw out a number because I don't know what it is exactly. Well, the reason I ask is there's a geologist in Australia 
we're getting out of the realm of my expertise here when it comes to ocean acidification. Uh, so the question has been about volcanoes and the uh, relative impact of volcanoes versus anthropogenic emissions. Um, I can say without a doubt that anthropogenic emissions are what is controlling climate change right now. As to what the relative contribution of volcanoes is, I don't think I can pick that one up. Do I see you itching for the mic? No. <laughs> um, not directly, but uh, what we do know is that there have been a number of studies that have been able to use uh, isotopic signatures to trace anthropogenic carbon into the ecosystem. So we have a decent understanding from a number of places throughout the world on what that rate is, and it, is, it, it does have an anthropogenic signal. So it's not directly answering your question, but we do know that um, uh, the relative proportion of the anthropogenic piece in, in certain ecosystems because of the isotopic signature. Any more questions? Oh my, more the yes. there. Uh, what concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is needed to slow down ocean acidification? I will let her answer that. But um, you know, what levels would slow it down? Um, I don't know that number. Uh, but what I can say is what we know is if we were to stop now producing carbon dioxide, we still will deal with uh, ocean acidification for 100 years. It's going to take a long time to absorb the concentration and equilibrate with what's in the atmosphere already. So what we're studying is going to happen at some, at some level. That's not to say we don't try to mitigate, um, but we're, we won't be able to reverse at this point based on what we're, what we're looking at. Uh, so I would encourage you to um, uh, adopt the IPCC standards. Again, I don't remember what the numbers are off the top of my head. Um, I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning to fly out here to talk to you guys. <laughs> I'm just reaching for words that aren't there anymore. On any given day, I ought to know the number that you're looking for, and I cannot think of it right now. Um, but yes, so I, uh, 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 I would refer you to the IPCC standards. Those are the globally accepted numbers that internationally scientists have contributed to, um, including scientists from NOAA, and I stand behind those numbers. What kind of effects are being measured on salmon at any stage of their life cycle? Right, so effects that are being measured on salmon. So salmon research is still at its really early stages, especially compared to crab that Bob is working on. Uh, there's a young researcher at the University of Washington um, who is measuring the impacts that ocean acidification has on sensory functions for salmon. Um, so rather than it being impacts you know, on their body, like shell dissolution or skeletal dissolution, uh, it, ocean acidification impacts the way that they perceive the world, particularly through their sense of smell. Um, so the sense of, you know, if OA is interfering with their sense of smell, they both can't smell their food the right way, um, and they can't smell predators in the right way. So for example, if another salmon gets attacked and there's blood in the water, rather than swimming away from the blood in the water, um, some of these early experiments seem to be indicating that that salmon is now swimming towards the blood in the water, just because the signal is getting crossed in their brain as a result of ocean acidification. But that's really, that's the best I can tell you. Uh, th there, there aren't any results to that effect in, in the literature at this time. And I wouldn't really expect there to be. Um, the physiological processes that are supporting those bones are going to probably be set aside from the uh, acidified water around them. Again, this is going to be more of an ion balance issue um, in, in an animal that doesn't have a shell. Um, there is a study uh, that is just starting that's, that's funded to look at pink salmon, and we'll be doing that at the... Um, uh, the hatchery in Seward, uh, and we'll be taking uh, hatchery smolts and looking similar to what we did in Kodiak, only we'll be looking at the, the pink salmon. So we'll be looking at more macro level responses, survival and growth in particular. Uh, those will then be again modeled into a kind of a population uh, dynamics and uh, socioeconomic response. Uh, so that's something that's uh, funded and ongoing right now. Has any of the salmon sensory research been published? Yes, yeah, the University of Washington works published. 
So those impacts on the sense of smell temporary or were they permanent throughout the salmon's life? The, um, the work on salmon, uh, well, we don't know if it was temporary or not. They didn't continue to look at the salmon over time. Uh, there's been some work on uh, zebrafish as well, um, and a, a couple of species in Australia that have um, found the same effect, um, and that was permanent. And that was throughout the development stages and early life cycle um, that then was permanent into the juvenile uh, stages. So I think we're going to wrap it up. That was, those were excellent questions from this audience. And I think we should give one more round of applause to our speakers. There's probably some more handouts in the back. The list of sign-up is up there. And everyone is here if you have additional questions. So thanks again for coming. <laughs> I do my best. I mean, there's a lot of basic climate change basics.